Good morning, everyone. My name is Natalie Vermette, and uh, as chair of the ABA's Tort Trial and Insurance uh, Practice Group Intellectual Property Committee, I am a, also, as a very proud fellow Canadian, I have the honor and the privilege of introducing you to the, uh, this morning to our very special guest speaker, um, our, the Honorable Mr. Justice Michel Basterache, uh, Justice of the Canadian Supreme Court, who, is, uh, who has attended the whole conference along with his lovely wife, uh, Yolande Basterache. Um, our Supreme Court, just like the U.S. Supreme Court, is comprised of nine judges and is also the highest court of the land. And just like your Supreme Court, there are those dreaded buttons or traffic lights that uh, pleading counsel have to watch uh, as they turn red and advise you in no uncertain terms that your time is up. So we have Barbara here this today to act <laughs> as our, <laughs> our traffic cop. <clears throat> but she has told us that <laughs> it'll be fine. Uh, Justice Basterash has followed an extremely interesting, diverse, and at times demanding career path that has been recognized by numerous awards. Before being named to the New Brunswick Court of Appeal on March 1st, 1995, and later to the Supreme Court of Canada, Justice Basterash worked in government, in the private sector, as a business executive, as an academic, and in the private practice of law. His multifaceted understanding and love of law undoubtedly allow him to draw from a deep pool of personal experience. On September 30th of this year, Justice Bastarache celebrated a milestone, his 10th year on the bench of the Supreme Court. We are delighted to have him today with us to present his experience of the Canadian Supreme Court Harvard Mouse patent case decision that was rendered on December 5th, 2002. The Canadian Harvard Mouse patent case is one of Canada's most significant patent decisions. The five to four split decision held that in Canada, the oncogene mouse, or from what I've learned yesterday, uh, a transgenic mouse which, uh, with cells genetically altered by a cancer promoting gene was a higher life form and as such is not patentable because it is not a manufacture or composition of matter so as to fall within the definition of an invention under Section 2 of the Canadian Patent Act. Justice Bastarache was of the general view that patenting higher life forms raises serious ethical, environmental, and practical issues that are beyond the scope of the judiciary's mandate and should be addressed by the Canadian Parliament as issues of national policy. The other side of the debate was addressed by the four dissenting judges who raised several cogent arguments in support of providing some form of intellectual property protection to higher life forms, speaking to the extraordinary scientific achievement of permanently altering the genes of an animal when such alteration does not occur in nature. Notwithstanding its comparable intellectual property legislation, Canada arrived at a different legal solution uh, or result from the United States and other countries where similar patent applications resulted in patents being issued. Now that the stage has been set, I am positive that you will glean an enriched understanding of the Canadian perspective and analysis uh, of, the, uh, of the applicable issues from listening to the unique point of view you are being offered here today by our very own Justice Bastarache. So, without further ado, and just in case those dreaded red lights turn red, <laughs> Uh, no. <laughs> you are wearing a red shirt. <laughs> please join me in uh, extending a very warm welcome to the Honorable Justice Michelle Bethel. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here and to be able to speak to you about the role of the court, especially in dealing with these issues. I think uh, it's not only a question of determining whether it's a good thing or a bad thing to patent higher life forms. The question is who should be deciding the issue and whether the legislation that is in place does cover such a thing. And just to follow up on the presentations that were just made, I'd like to show you an article that was in the paper just as I left Ottawa to come here. 
a natural fear of mammals. And this uh, is an article that was uh, published um, in the uh, local newspaper in Ottawa and authored by Margaret Somerville. Margaret Somerville is a teacher of law and medicine at uh, McGill University and uh, is considered to be one of the uh, most important ethicists uh, in, in, our, in our country. Uh, I think this uh, illustrates uh, the fact that uh, the public's attention to these issues is brought about by articles such as these, and that uh, articles such as these not only create concern within the population, but they create special expectations vis-a-vis -vis what the courts are supposed to be doing. So in the last five years, the Supreme Court of Canada has rendered two significant decisions in the area of biotechnology patent law. And I've been invited to discuss these decisions and mostly to explain what I now believe to be the state of the law on the issue, as well as the repercussions of the two decisions in question. The two decisions in question. The first, of course, is Harvard College versus Canada, and the second is Monsanto versus Schmeiser. As you will see, a number of commentators have stated that those two decisions are not reconcilable and that the attention of Parliament to the issue of patenting higher life forms is essential. In Canada, the Patent Office divides living matter into higher life forms defined as multicellular differentiated organisms, plants, seeds and animals, and lower life forms defined as essentially unicellular organisms in composition, bacteria, fungi, cells in culture, transformed cell lines, and hybrid domas. The patent office has always held that higher life forms are not patentable for over a uh, hundred years, especially because, and I quote, there is not sufficient control over the invention and no reproducibility in a consistent manner. The invention at issue in the Harvard mouse case related to a genetically engineered mouse. The mouse was modified to include the gene that makes it susceptible to developing cancerous tumors. As a result, the animal is particularly useful in cancer research. There were a total of 26 claims. Suffice it to say that the Patent Office refused claims 1 to 12, which were directed to the higher life form, basically the animal itself. The Federal Court of Canada had upheld the decision of the Patent Office. That decision later was reversed by a 2 to 1 decision in the Federal Court of Appeal. It should be noted that by the time the appeal was heard the appeal of that appeal was heard by the Supreme Court of Canada, Harvard had already obtained a patent on the invention in issue in the United States, Japan, and Europe. In the Supreme Court of Canada, our, the justices were divided five to four. Now, the main legal issue considered by the Supreme Court was whether the genetically altered mouse was an invention. And that term is defined in the Patent Act. It is important to note at this point that the word invention is defined in the same way as in the American legislation. Basically, it reads, any new and useful art, process, machine, manufacture, or composition of matter, or any new and useful improvement in any art, process, machine, manufacture, or composition of matter. After a long review of the language used in the definition of the word invention and the object and scheme of the Patent Act, the majority of the court concluded that higher life forms were not included in the definition of invention. With respect to lower life forms, the majority acknowledged that these were patentable since 1982 and that the Patent Act did not explicitly differentiate between lower and higher life forms. Such a distinction was nonetheless defensible on the basis of common sense differences between the two. 
it was obvious to the majority that microorganisms are produced en masse as chemical compounds and are prepared and formed in large numbers which are measurable and uh, can be processed uniformly as with the same properties and characteristics. But the same could not be said of animals or plants. The majority also highlighted the capacity of animals to display emotion, complexity of reaction, and to direct behavior in a manner that is not predictable as stimulus and response. And these traits, of course, were said to be unique to higher life forms. I would like to add here that many interveners in the Harvard College case argued that the patentability of higher life forms should be precluded on moral and ethical grounds. Certain environmentalists were also opposed to the patenting of higher life forms because they feared that genetically modified life forms could be inadvertently released into the general environment with unforeseen consequences. Both the majority and the minority of the court held that the commissioner has no discretion to refuse a patent on the basis of public policy considerations. The majority insisted that any refusal to grant a patent had to be based on express provisions in the Patent Act. Now I say this because the decision of the majority should be contrasted with the situation in the European community where Article 53A of the European Patent Convention specifically provides that patent shall not be granted in respect of inventions the exploitation of which would be contrary to public order or morality. I also mention public policy considerations here because as you will see, a number of commentators have argued that the unanimous position of the court on this issue may have been somewhat compromised by the decision of the majority in the Monsanto case, of which I will speak shortly. My view, my personal view was that if moral and public policy considerations cannot play any role uh, in the decision of the commissioner, it certainly can't play any role in the court's decision. And uh, as you will see, I think that the minority in this case and the majority in Monsanto did base their decision largely on public policy considerations. The dissenting judges in Harvard College disagreed with the distinction drawn between higher and lower life forms in terms of patentability. They insisted that most Western jurisdictions had issues patents on the Harvard mouse and that there was no rational line to be drawn between lower and higher life forms anyway. They saw no distinction between the fertilized, genetically altered egg and the resulting oncomouse. It is quite clear that what is important to a good understanding of the decision of our court in Harvard College is the compelling authority of the interpretive approach in deciding this kind of case. The word invention for the purposes of Section 2 of the Patent Act is clearly an expanding concept. The majority wrote, because the act was designed in part to promote innovation, it is only reasonable to expect the definition of invention to be broad enough to encompass unforeseen and unanticipated technology. What the majority rejected was the notion that the word invention could be as expansive as suggested in the American case of Czech Robarty. The reason for this is essentially that the definition of invention is based on enumerated categories that were held to be exhaustive. Now applying our rules of statutory interpretation, the majority held that if an application was captured by one of the mentioned categories, policy grounds and exclusions not provided for in the act could not operate to prevent the granting of a patent. But the definition of invention could not be ignored and its terms had to be interpreted according to the usual rules of statutory interpretation. Invention, therefore, could not be 
as quoted by others, anything new and useful made by man. That being set aside, section two reads, as earlier mentioned, any new and useful art, machine, and the operating words, manufacture or composition of matter. Now, in seeking to define the word manufacture, the majority stated that this word could commonly be understood to denote that non-living matter can easily be a product or process, while the mouse cannot be anal analogized to a manufacturer when it cannot be produced in an, in an industrial setting. Nor did the word in its vernacular sense include a higher life form. So then we had to turn to a composition of matter. The majority noted that its construction must be narrower than that offered by the, uh, by the American Supreme Court because given the wording of the act, the other listed categories of invention, including machine and manufacture, would become redundant. The majority writes, the phrase composition of matter is somewhat broader than the term manufacture. It is a basic principle of statutory interpretation that the meaning of questionable words or phrases in the statute can be ascertained by reference to the meaning of the words or phrases associated with them. Also, a collective term that completes an enumeration is most often restricted to the same genus as those words, even though the collective term may ordinarily have a broader meaning. The words machine and manufacture do not imply a conscious, sentient, and living creature. This provides prima facie support for the conclusion that the phrase composition of matter is best read as not including such life forms. But of course, that's not the end of the argument. This argument is bolstered by the fact that there are a number of factors that make it difficult to regard higher life forms as composition of matter. Then we looked at dictionary definitions to see whether they would show an indication that it could be wide enough, that those words could be wide enough to, in, to include living creatures within the terms of a composition of matter. And of course, that was not the case. A radical expression of the definition would then, of necessity, be an enlargement of the intention of Parliament. That was our view. Now, the other part of the interpretive process is a consideration of the scheme and object of the Act. Here, the majority relied on arguments that higher life forms posed problems that were never present with regard to inanimate objects and not anticipated by the Act. We relied essentially on the report of the Canadian Biotechnology Advisory Committee and spoke of the problems of innocent bystanders and experimental use exceptions in particular, as well as that of using human tissue with a view to uh, exnotransplantation. In familiar terms, what was being asked, as one of the parties put it, was why would a chimpanzee be a composition of matter and not a human being? The dissenting judges maintained that the Oncomouse qualifies as a composition of matter and also as a manufacturer. They write this, composition of matter is an open-ended expression. Statutory subject matter must be framed broadly because by definition the Patent Act must contemplate the unforeseeable. The definition is not expressly confined to inanimate matter and the appellant commissioner agrees that composition of organic and certain living matter can be patented. They were talking, of course, about the bacteria. In the case of the Oncomouse, the modified genetic material is a physical substance, therefore it is matter. The fertilized mouse egg is therefore biological matter. The combination of the two forms of matter by the process described in the disclosure is thus, as pointed out by the Federal Court of Appeal, a composition of matter. 
What then is the justification under the Patent Act for drawing a line between certain compositions of living matter and other compositions of living matter? The minority argued, in essence, that all of the dividing lines proposed by the majority were policy-driven and that any such policy should be introduced by Parliament. But, of course, they never addressed the rule of interpretation I just mentioned or the problem of replication. The problem of replication is important because when you're talking about um, the... Uh, The, the, sec the second uh, element, putting together matter in order to produce an object, it has to be put together by man. And, uh, of course, the argument made before us is the replication of the mouse is not made, of course, by the scientists. Uh, Myra Tofik, who is... Uh, an expert in patent law and a few other major commentators in Canada explained that the position of the majority, the minority rather, expressed here is necessarily inconsistent with their own reference to foreign legislation and judicial interpretation. This is where I say that there's a, problems, a problem with this uh, intervention of policy or public uh, interest in the decision. The minority writes this, legislation varies, but broadly speaking, Canada has sought to harmonize its concepts of intellectual property with other like-minded jurisdictions. The mobility of capital and technology makes it desirable that comparable jurisdictions with comparable intellectual property legislation arrive at similar legal results. Now, it is clear that this case did not involve interpreting provisions of domestic legislation that expressly implemented an international obligation, nor did it raise transjudicial or extraterritorial aspects on its facts. The minority was willing to review a number of non-binding foreign sources and international law principles, not as passing references, but in a concerted effort to ensure consistency between domestic law and comparable jurisdictions. The commentators signal that this is contrary to all of the jurisprudence of our court. Although globalization is having a certain effect on domestic legal affairs, commentators note that there is a clear demarcation between domestic law and international law. They add that the Supreme Court has been willing to open up the interpretive method to actively include international norms and foreign sources of logic in its deliberations between two distinct scenarios. First, it has expanded the rules of interpretation to permit reference to international treaties and foreign judgments in all cases in which domestic legis legislation under review has been expressively and impliedly enacted or amended in order to implement an international obligation. And this was confirmed strictly in the case of national corn growers in our court. The other scenario permits extrinsic sources to be used to interpret domestic legislation when it is expressly interesting or impliedly necessary to look at the international context. Now, some examples of this are the decisions of our Supreme Court in national corn, as I've said, and mostly Baker versus Canada. According to Ruth Sullivan, the recognized authority in statutory interpretation in Canada, it's nevertheless certain that the Supreme Court has adopted a pragmatic approach to decision-making and that it's now willing to draw on all sources to persuade audiences that its choices are appropriate. It's also quite clear that commonality of interest among peoples has never envisaged the possibility that courts harmonize interpretations in order to protect like-minded institutions. I argue that this approach must be rejected for a number of reasons. 
First, it is not at all clear that there exists a firm international consensus with regard to intellectual property legislation. Second, it is not clear that consideration of decisions taken abroad should lead Canadians to strive to obtain the same legal result. For the court to look for a broader interpretive context to raise its knowledge of external aspects of its decision is laudable. But this is totally different from forcing on domestic laws an interpretation geared to attain a similar legal, legal result. I think the minority treats the expansive approach as self-evidently correct. What is most disconcerting is that this is that this approach completely dispenses with the need to discuss the interpretive method adopted by the Supreme Court. Commentators also question the belief that there exists an, in, uh, an international normative IP framework that requires harmonization. What is needed is broadening of legal discourse, comparative deliberation, not trying to keep up with some kind of international development. Even if that were the case, I ask myself, what would be the like-minded jurisdictions? All common law countries? All Western countries? All English and French speaking countries? Net importers of IP to Canada? And then who should decide? It's interesting to note says one commentator, Tofik, that the minority had chosen different countries in a case that was heard at the same time called Tiberge when they were looking at another issue. So is it that you just choose the countries according to the persuasiveness? As earlier noted, Critics agree that the problem in failing to apply the rules of statutory interpretation by the minority had a spillover effect. It affected the quality of the decision requiring an interpretation of the word use in the Monsanto case. As I've said, the Harvard College decision cannot be considered, I think, without addressing the decision in Monsanto. So let me say a few things about Monsanto. Monsanto held the patent that claimed a shimmeric gene, a method of inserting the gene into a plant's DNA, the plant cell in which the gene had been inserted, and a method for regenerating resistant plants from genetically modified cells. As the founder plant propagates, all the cells and its progeny will contain the patented gene, but the patent claims never extended to the whole plants or the seeds. Such a claim, of course, would have been inconsistent with Canadian patent law as established in the Harvard College case. Monsanto sells the seeds of genetically altered canola through its distributors. Distributors resell under the trade name Roundup Ready to farmers. The farmers must agree to buy only from an authorized agent, to use only Roundup herbicide, and to sell the crop only to a commercial purchaser authorized by Monsanto. And they agree never to sell or to give the seed to a third party or to use them for replanting. Now, these restrictions are necessary. Why? Well, simply because of the replicatory nature of the invention. Typically, the doctrine of exhaustion would permit farmers to save and reuse the seed purchased by the distributor. So Schmeiser operated a commercial farming operation and he had identified a small number of canola, uh, canola plants on his land growing from Roundup Ready canola seeds that were blown over from his neighbor. He harvested these plants together with the other plants he had planted, and then he collected the seeds of all of his 
produ production, replanted them, and eventually produced a thousand acres uh, that were considered to be Roundup Ready canola plants. Schmeiser was not a party to a technology use agreement with any distributor and had never bought anything from Monsanto and actually testified that he didn't want to produce any genetically modified plants because it would affect his uh, market. He was selling to people who didn't want these kinds of plants. The majority found in favor of Monsanto, who sued Schmeiser. Basing its decision primarily on the principles of statutory interpretation, which required that the inquiry into the meaning of the word use, because they said uh, Schmeiser would be sued not for re reproducing the, uh, the invention, but for using the, the invention. So they said that the word use must be grounded in an understanding of the reasons for which the patent protection is accorded. Now, even here, for those who know patent law, you'll see that we're slipping from the traditional definitions. Commentators were quick to note that the majority made reference to the standard utilitarian justification for patent protection, but that its interpretation of the word use bears no relationship at all with that utilitarian justification rationale. Wendy Adams, an expert in the area, argues that this is demonstrated by the fact that the majority's interpretation radically transformed the established test for determining infringement. Traditionally, consideration of infringing use in patent law is an uncomplicated matter. A court must decide whether an ostensibly infringing use falls within the scope of the claims. The emphasis is on the textual analysis of the claims, given the significance of interpretation in defining the scope of the claims themselves. But the majority in this case held that the purpose of the statutory monopoly granted by the Patent Act is to protect the patentee's business interest. Use is therefore defined as any activity by the defendant that furthers its own commercial interests, given that there is a commercial benefit to be derived from the invention that belongs to the patent holder. Therefore, if Schmeiser is pursuing his own be benefit commercially, then he is affecting the commercial benefit of Monsanto. That's the argument. Adams suggests that what has been a straightforward comparative analysis of equivalency, literal or substantial, between the impugned activity and the scope of the patentee's claims now includes an abstract inquiry into the inherent nature of the disputed activity itself. He argues that what is at issue now is whether the activity results in a commercial benefit that can be causally connected to the use of the invention. The normative acceptance of Monsanto's claims derives not from its reference to the necessity of a statutory monopoly to protect the private investment in public goods, but in the function that patents are expected to perform in the change political economy of the market. What we see here is that the use of the form of intellectual property is to perform the function typically carried out by property. Property is related to fully exploiting the commercial potential of the corporate asset. Full commercial exploitation requires exclusive rights over the whole of the asset at the discretion of the corporation, and not simply over the particular uses that are determined by the state to be appropriate to balance the public and private interest in the creation and dissemination of new technology. Richard Gold explains that these claims exceeded the utilitarian rationale of patent rights as mere statutory directives 
designed to grant control over that portion of the commercial potential necessary to address the market failure associated with the public goods nature of these assets. He says this, the argument for greater patent protection should be understood for what it is, an attempt to maximize profit, not to maximize innovation. Clearly, the company would prefer to have as large a monopoly as possible, but patent law is not about individual profit maximization. It's about maximizing the overall level of innovation in society. The two do not go together. As in Harvard College, I argue that there is slippage here. The political economy of the market, the profit motive, has come to have normative acceptance. But this is not the way it should be. I agree with Adams when he states that the demands of individual actors in the market, although they have, however valid within the political economy, must be reconciled with one or more of the accepted rationales for patent protection. The majority in Monsanto held that a patentee is entitled to any commercial benefit that can be derived from an invention. The same majority reasoned that its decision was based on the utilitarian rationale, which justifies the protection only uh, of the invention, not profit maximization. The majority found genes and modified cells making up a plant to be patentable. So Monsanto doesn't directly overrule Harvard College. The majority explains how these two decisions can coexist. But I still think the two decisions are very difficult to reconcile. At issue was whether Mr. Schmeiser had used the patent invention by harvesting Roundup Ready canola plants found on his land, replanting the seeds and then selling the Roundup Ready canola grown. Schmeiser argued that deciding the case in favor of Mosanto would be in effect granting a patent not over the gene, but not over the cells comprising the genes, but the whole plant. And this result, of course, would be inconsistent with Harvard College. The majority inquired into the meaning of the word use then by stating it must be grounded in an understanding of the reasons for which this patent is accorded. And they wrote this, huge investments of energy and money have been poured into the quest for better seeds and better plants. One way in which that investment is protected is through the Patent Act giving investors a monopoly when they create a novel and useful invention in the realm of plant science, such as genetically modified genes and cells. Now the problem, as noted earlier, is that the majority's interpretation bears little or no relationship at all with the justification rationale for patents. In fact, the majority's interpretation results in an entirely new test for an infringing use. Under the present law, a patent doesn't provide a patentee with an affirmative right of use. As noted by Adams, negative rights are not equivalent in either form or function to affirmative rights granted to property. If it is clearly understood that the Commissioner of Patents has no discretion to refuse a patent on the basis of public policy considerations, it's hard to understand how public policy considerations such as those just noted can justify this interpretation of the word use. Now, while the majority states that it's not inclined to the view that Mr. Schmeiser had made cells within the meaning of the act, it finds it unnecessary to decide the point having concluded that Schmeiser used patented genes and cells by infringing and thereby uh, had infringed the patent. They came to the conclusion that, and I quote, saving and planting seed, then harvesting and selling the resultant plants containing the seeds, on a common sense view, 
constitute utilization of the patented material for production and advantage within the meaning of section 42. The reason for this, as stated earlier, is that these actions deprived Monsanto of the full enjoyment of their monopoly. So the majority affirms that Schmeider's involvement with the disputed canola is clearly commercial in nature. As mentioned earlier, it was held that irrespective of whether or not the defendant benefits or profits from the patented invention, the use of the plant, which contains a patented element, constitute an infringement in every case where the invention is significant to the commercial interest of the defendant. The majority opined that use was not dependent upon the defendant actually using the patented element. The patent holder was entitled to protection as long as the element was significant. And this meant that Schmeiser's saving, planting, and harvesting the seeds found on his land constituted a use even though he never took commercial advantage of the special utility of the invention. It was sufficient that Schmeiser be aware of the presence of Monsanto's invention on his property. Then he was required to rebut a presumption of use. The minority position, of course, is that the majority's reasoning permits a patent which would otherwise have to be denied. Monsanto's patent is specifically for uh, genetically modified genes and cells in a laboratory prior to regeneration, nothing more. The minority would not have accepted to interpret the word use as broadly. Use is properly limited to depriving the patentee of the monopoly over the use of the invention as construed in the claims. To hold that there's a right to commercial exploitation of the entire plant on the basis of replication of the gene and cell through the plant has to result in a finding inconsistent with Harvard College. In this case, the majority did address the question of replication, contrary to their position, their minority position in Harvard Most. It simply stated that plants reproduce through the laws of nature rather than through home, human intervention. It noted, that this it noted that this argument ignores the role of human beings in agricultural propagation. It observed that many inventions make use of natural processes in order to work. Now, Morrow and Ingram provide this comment. The observation that many inventions make use of natural processes in order to work is interesting in that it demonstrates the majority's incomplete understanding of technology. In fact, every invention makes use of natural processes in order to work. The human race and its works are part of the natural world and every one, everything we do is conditioned by and dependent on the natural world. These authors remind us that one of the interesting aspects of the Monsanto case is whether Monsanto could similarly restrict Schmeiser's use of his own crop based on its rights under the act alone and in the absence of the Monsanto Technology Agreement. As noted earlier, commentators find it disturbing to see how the majority could ignore the historical meaning of use. How could they ignore the French version of the act which uses the word exploiter, which is not ambiguous, as ambiguous as the English term. Stack says this, in the author's view, the law of patent infringement is complex enough without confusing acts of infringement with intention to infringe. An injunction against future use is all that should have been applied to Schmeiser. The suggestion instead of a possible ignorance defense likely creates more problems than it solves. About what does the farmer have to know to become an infringer. 
the patent, the invention, the presence of an odd characteristic in his crop. How will ignorance defense work, as farmers increasingly assume as a matter of course that some modifications have spread into their land? In the present case, as I've said, Schmeiser never operated the invention, never intended to benefit from the transgene. Critics argue that the majority's definition is a long way from the idea that use means to work and operate the device the inventor intended. The majority use, of course, the commercial concept to broaden patent rights. It tied the infringement to the detriment of the commercial interest of Monsanto, despite the fact that the act only empowers patentees to require licenses for the exercise of exclusive statutory privileges. Commentators say this, if mere possession of an invention, the use of which are patently usually licenses, is sufficiently detrimental to a commercial interest to constitute an infringement, then possession is use, and the old rules to the contrary don't apply. The majority noted that there was no rebuttal of the presumption of use because Schmeiser presented no evidence of an attempt to divest himself of the transgene. It's not clear why the majority would have held that Schmeiser had to cede his own property when the act doesn't grant any right of possession to it. General control of the plant not only exceeds the scope of the patent, but the scope of the right to use. This is a clear extension of the position taken by both the majority and minority in Harvard College. Clearly, the policy concerns were too great in Monsanto and probably overtook the principled approach to establishing limits on intellectual property rights. So what then is the state of the law in Canada? I believe the state, the law in Canada is in a state of uncertainty and that Parliament should intervene. It's my view that the decision in Monsanto in particular may have unforeseen effects on the ownership of conventional crops and are ex that are exposed to genetically modified reproductive materials. Bruce uh, Ziff explains that seeds that germinate will contain genetic material from both the donor and recipient plants and those seeds may themselves migrate in various ways. Canola seeds are lightweight and can easily be airborne. As the commercial value of the plant is reposed in the seeds, most are harvested. However, however there is inevitably some residual spillage in the harvesting or transportation of any crop. Canola seeds have been found to subsist for up to 10 years in undisturbed soils. Moreover, a Canadian research paper suggests that Roundup Ready canola seeds are used as chicken feed and spread within manure uh, remain, and remain viable over a year. The movement of pollen can lead to merging of genetic materials among different strains of sexually compatible canola. On the Canadian prairies, there are at least six varieties of cultivated canola any one of these varieties can cross with the others. In rare cases, genetic transfer to other plants can also occur. As noted in a recent New York Times editorial, these results demand, I think, a careful assessment of how such plants should be regulated. There are also very important legal implications. The majority view in Monsanto provides that first-generation seeds that make their way into someone's land provide Monsanto with rights that are never lost. This is a change of property law. As Ziff would say, some rights are now common law resistant. <laughs> there's, a, <laughs> there's also a problem where Roundup Ready pollen fertilizes a canola plant owned by a farmer who doesn't know it. Who owns the plant? 
the ordinary rules of accession, should they apply. The majority in Monsanto refused to deal with accession on the basis that the issue was not property rights, but patent rights. But really, are these patent rights not property rights? It's also a fact that the ruling introduces indirectly a new accession rule. As if remarks, the infusion of every seed or speck of pollen into the crop of someone else renders Monsanto a co-owner of every plant. Can you use your property to damage me unless I course I permit it? This is simple enough to understand. Although the seeds belong to the farmer, the patent still exists and the right to use them is in the hands of Monsanto. Furthermore, it's impossible to purge the gene from the plant. This is why Monsanto is said to be inconsistent with Harvard College. According to Harvard College, it is the gene and the cell that are patentable, not the plant. As noted by the authors, unless a discrete patent defense is allowed for such situations, the property rights of otherwise innocent farmers can be affected by blow-by reception of certain types of genetic material. So the legal considerations resulting from these two cases, as well as all of the scientific and economic concerns we heard about in these two days, should prompt, I think, in our case, a reconsideration of all these issues by Parliament. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Is there time for questions? We have to go to lunch now. We can take the questions when we come back. Okay. Sure. All right. So save your questions for when we come back from lunch. <laughs> lunch is now served with parameters in the annex where we were yesterday.